Good afternoon. I know it's a wet day and a, a holiday week, so I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, we want to talk today about the state of U.S.-Canada bilateral defense relations. And let me in particular welcome you to CSIS's new home here at 1616 Rhode Island Avenue. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I'm the Henry A. Kissinger Chair and Director of the International Security Program here at CSIS. And I'm very pleased to have the honor of introducing today's guest speaker. And this is the Chief of Defense Staff of the Canadian Armed Forces, General Tom Lawson. General Lawson has had a long and distinguished career in the Canadian Armed Forces, serving in his current position since October 2012. Prior to his most recent promotion, he served as Deputy Commander at NORAD, which is at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. So he is no stranger to the importance of U.S.-Canadian defense cooperation. He has also held such distinguished positions as Assistant Chief of the Air Staff and Commandant of the Royal Military College in Kingston. He led the stand-up of the Strategic Joint Staff as part of the Canadian Armed Forces Transformation Team and has served as Commanding Officer of 412 or 412. 412 Squadron, perhaps, based in Ottawa. General Lawson graduated from the Royal Military College of Canada with a Bachelor of Science degree, as well as a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. And while attending the U.S. Armed Forces Command and Staff College in Montgomery, Alabama, he completed a Master's of Public Administration at Auburn. So he's um, thoroughly educated, I think it's fair to say. Drawing on that record of service and expertise, General Lawson has agreed to share his thoughts on the U.S.-Canadian defense relationship. Secretary Hagel just last week called this relationship one of the strongest in the world, and indeed our Canadian friends have fought alongside American troops in the volatile Kandahar province in Afghanistan at the height of the conflict, and they continue to deploy some 950 troops in a training capacity near Kabul. Just this past Friday, Secretary Hagel and Defense Minister Nicholson signed the Canada-U.S.-Asia-Pacific Cooperation Framework to increase our security cooperation in this important region. This will be done in the framework of the Canada-U.S. Permanent Joint Board on Defense, which has been in existence since 1940. This is the context in which General Lawson will address the state of U.S.-Canada bilateral defense relations, and we all look forward to hearing what he has to say on the subject. Before I bring him up to the podium, I want to ask everyone to please write down any, on the index cards that we've provided to you, any questions that his remarks or this opportunity for dialogue evoke. And if you do not have a card, please raise your hand and we'll distribute them to you now. After General Lawson completes his prepared remarks, I'll ask the staff to collect your index cards. And we have two of our senior fellows, Stephanie Sanicostro and Sam Brannon here, who will combine the questions and group like groupings and facilitate a follow-on discussion. So with that, I want to thank again General Lawson. And please uh, join me in welcoming him today. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Kathleen, and uh, just absolutely delighted to be here, feeling very affectionate towards, uh, uh, towards Washington, regardless of that atrocious weather. The Washington Capitals just came uh, up into Canada and got beaten by both the Montreal Canadiens and my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs. So what a wonderful city. Uh, it is also, uh, uh, with all the extensive traveling my family and I have done across the United States amongst your great states and uh, cities. This is our very favorite here, and all of you who are based here will know exactly why that is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank CSIS for inviting me here this afternoon. I thank you for being here, and I really am pleased to be here at an institution that's uh, so well known for its forward thinking. And before uh, I go any further, let me, let me thank the organizers, your hard work behind the scenes is, is very much appreciated. Uh, over the course of my career, I've had many opportunities, as Kathleen was saying, to work with the great men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces, uh, ranging from my time at Staff College as a, as a puppy, uh, and uh, then all the way to uh, just a, a year and a half ago when I was uh, happily in uh, Colorado Springs uh, doing my NORAD duties when I got called out for, uh, for another posting. But during this past year, as Canada's uh, newest Chief of Defence Staff, I, I've been able to, our, to view our relationship, the Canadian-American relationship, from a slightly different perspective. And I must say, I have a renewed appreciation for just how close and just how important and just how far-reaching our bilateral relationship is. 
There's a real spirit of partnership and collaboration that permeates our defense relationship, and our governments and militaries are connected through a network of arrangements and joint institutions that really do form a fabric that's very impressive. And I think it's largely because long ago our two countries learned how to leverage each other's strengths and how our mutual prosperity and security depends upon our military being truly connected and interoperable, not just at home, but also abroad. And the Canadian Armed Forces, for its size, is one of those few with the capabilities that allow us to be engaged anywhere in the world, agile, deployable, and responsive. And being a reliable partner in continental defense is, is certainly one of our most important priorities. At the same time, we in Canada are also committed to doing our fair share on the international front. And it's my sincere hope that when you leave here today, you'll have a better appreciation for what the Canadian Armed Forces do on the world stage and here in North America as well. Let's speak a little bit about the foundation of the Canada-U.S. relationship as we see it. Canada and the U.S. have a long history of cooperation on defense and security issues. The strong ties between our militaries were developed in part by fighting side by side in most of the major conflicts over the past hundred years. We have, fought, we have fought together in both of the world wars. We were both founding members of NATO in 1949. We fought together as battle buddies in Korea 60 years ago, and that battle buddy theme has been found over the last decade throughout the mission in Afghanistan. As a result, we've developed close personal bonds, we've learned from each other, and we've seen the importance of making sure our forces are truly interoperable even allowing the soldiers of our own nations to be led by general officers from the other armed forces. And that's a bond of trust you only find between the very closest of nations. The ultimate foundation of our interoperability is anchored in NATO, where we've been working together with our transatlantic partners for over 60 years now. But NATO is about much more than interoperability. Uh, it is a political alliance of like-minded democracies united by common values and principles. It has demonstrated the political will to act, and it has a capability to do so. It can be a true force for good, and we need to ensure that we, the U.S. and Canada, uphold that transatlantic commitment with our European friends and allies. Between our two nations, our long and close partnership has allowed, and at the same time, required the establishment of joint institutions to help us continue to strengthen our defense cooperation. Canada and the U.S. have a forum to discuss defense policies in the form of the Permanent Joint Board on Defense, affectionately known as the PJBD. And the PJBD was founded by U.S. President Roosevelt and Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King in 1940. And this board, through those years since that time, has examined virtually every important combined defense measure undertaken between our two countries since the Second World War until now, including the construction of distant early warning line of radars, the creation of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, as well as the response to the attacks of 9-11. The next gathering of the PJBD is going to be held in Ottawa this December it will be the 232nd meeting of this group in its 73 years of existence. But our most impressive cooperation is without a doubt something very warm in my heart, North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, created in 1958. Now many nations have bilateral relationships as for instance Canada and the United States have with our other allies. But the NORAD agreement is truly a unique construct in that it is a binational agreement. NORAD actually brings the monitoring and defense of North American aerospace under the same roof and for purposes of continental air defense actually does away with the border. Imagine that. When you read about NORAD history, you'll see that our government officials in the late 1950s took great pains to work out and determine just what this could mean this erasing of the border in the worst case, this potential loss of sovereignty. And the remarkable thing is that in the 55 years since the stand-up of NORAD, none of these concerns have come to amount to anything. In fact, in 2006, in the universal recognition that this agreement has been mutually beneficial, 
Our countries agreed to add maritime warning functions to NORAD, allowing us to share sensitive information on activities conducted off the North American coastlines. And I can tell you that the work being done by Canadians and Americans side by side is a very real symbol of our friendship, our commitment to cooperation, and our mutual trust. And as our defense relationship grows, these institutions grow as well to meet our new needs. With the NORAD strategic review, for example, Canada and the U.S. are looking at emerging defense and security challenges and, and how our countries can prepare to meet them. Safeguarding North America is not a simple task. Together, we cover a lot of land. That's why Canadians are proud to be a meaningful contributor to continental defense. And a good example of that is RadarSat-2. This satellite's data provides the Canadian Armed Forces with all, all day and night surveillance in areas where other equipment is challenged, simply unable to operate in harsh and unpredictable Arctic region, for example. And its 2018 replacement, the RadarSat Constellation mission, will enhance our current surveillance capabilities by allowing real-time tracking of ships approaching our mutual shorelines. Canada is the only Five Eyes partner other than the U.S. who is able to contribute to satellite surveillance in such a, an important way. And this is a capability that's going to be key to North American security and to our joint missions abroad. That's what leveraging each other's strength is all about. Let's talk a little bit about Canada and U.S. international cooperation in the Americas. Our interoperability and task sharing make us collectively stronger to defend our continent, and this translates to a strong partnership on the international front. In the Americas, for example, the Canadian Armed Forces have contributed to the U.S. efforts to address illicit trafficking in the hemisphere since 2006 through Operation Carib. Recently, Canada enhanced its, co contribute, uh, its contribution to this operation by increasing the number of deployments and flights conducting, conducting uh, counter-drug detection and monitoring the Caribbean region, the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the Central, Eastern, and Western Pacific Ocean. The Canadian Armed Forces are proud to participate in this international effort that intercepts and seizes millions of dollars of illicit drugs every year. Countering the spread of drug trafficking and organized crime in South and Central America is key in keeping our hemisphere safe and in promoting secure waterways, an essential part of the Canadian and U.S. economies and the economies of our partners in the South. By sharing our military resources, Canada and the U.S. are more efficient in the fight against transnational criminal organization. Canada's support to Op Carib is only one example of Canada's work in the Americas, where we're always ready to assist in the case of natural, a natural disaster, as we did in Haiti three years ago. And Canada is also involved actively in fostering cooperation with Mexico. Indeed, we hosted the first trilateral meeting of the North America defense ministers in March of last year. This meeting led to the establishment of a framework to develop cooperation between Canada the U.S. and Mexico on issues of mutual concern, including efforts to address transnational criminal organizations and to respond to disasters in the hemisphere. We're really looking forward to the second trilateral defense ministers meeting, which will be hosted by Mexico next year. Let's look at some of this international cooperation as it applies to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the best examples of Canada-U.S. operation internationally is NATO a central alliance for both of our nations, and a place where we work closely with our European allies to advance our shared global security interests. Thanks to NATO, Canada, the U.S., and many of our allies had a practical infrastructure to answer the request of the Arab League and the United Nations to take actions over Libya two years ago. And the NATO structure allowed partners outside of the alliance, particularly our Arab League partners in this case, to join us in this important mission. The Canadian Armed Forces were proud to assume operational command of the mission in Libya, in addition to providing air and maritime support. The Canadian contribution to the U.S. Security Coordinator for Israel and the Palestine Authority, or USSC, is another great example of Canadian and American efforts that are giving real results. Having visited this mission myself, I can tell you that we, together, 
Canadians and Americans are making a difference in the lives of both the Palestinians and the Israelis, and indeed contributing to the Middle East peace process. In that mission, Canada and the U.S. are working closely together, leveraging each other's personnel and expertise to achieve success. To me, this is what our defense relationship is really about. We come together and we get things done together. These are high profile examples, but our countries also cooperate in some areas that don't often get much attention. Just last month, for example, the Canadian Armed Forces responded to a request from the United Nations to deploy a Royal Canadian Air Force C-17 Globemaster heavy lift aircraft to, to transport 10 armored civilian vehicles between the US and Lebanon to assist in the efforts to eliminate the chemical weapons in Syria in line with the mandate of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And nearby in the Arabian Sea, Canada, along with US and 28 other nations, contributes regularly towards maritime security and counter-terrorism. Just a few weeks ago, our ship in that region, Her Majesty's Canadian ship Toronto, intercepted and boarded a suspicious vessel and discovered 154 bags of heroin. That's 154 bags of heroin that will never reach the streets of our two great nations, a small victory in the hard fight against drug smuggling. Let's look to Afghanistan and Asia Pacific for more cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you might remember what the former US ambassador to Canada, David Jacobson, said in the aftermath of 9-11. He said, our shared sense of security and the belief that the oceans on either side of us and the warm relations between us kept us distant and protected from the world's outside dangers came crashing down on that day. And that feeling was heartily felt across Canada. Remember a few days after the horrible events in New York and here in Washington, how over 100,000 people gathered together on Parliament Hill in Ottawa for a national day of mourning. Those Canadians came together not just to honour the thousands of victims who lost their lives, but also to clearly display their solidarity with their friends and neighbours in the wake of such sorrow and loss. And this was only the beginning of Canada's support to the U.S. in the wake of 9-11. Once the initial crisis of September 11th had been dealt with to the best of our shared abilities, we turned our attention to the terrorist network that had inspired and orchestrated the attacks and to the regime that gave that terrorist network sanctuary. As the international community quickly rallied, rallied behind the United States in condemning both Al-Qaeda and Afghanistan's Taliban government, Canada took a leading role in responding and had boots on ground as early as December of 2001. And from 2006 to 2010, our efforts in Afghanistan brought us to the volatile Kandahar province. Beginning in 2008, the U.S. backed us up with reinforcements, and these were U.S. soldiers placed under Canadian command. And as I've said, a powerful demonstration of the degree of interoperability and trust that exists between our armed forces. And from that demanding combat environment in Kandahar, we transitioned two years ago to Operation Attention, to, train, uh, to the training mission devoted to supporting NATO's main strategic objective, that of preparing the Afghan National Security Forces to take responsibility for Afghanistan's security by themselves. Since 2011, Canada has been the second largest contributor to the NATO training mission after the United States. And as Kathleen said, roughly 950 of our troops focused on giving the Afghans the tools they need not only to fight the Taliban and its affiliates, but also to train their own forces in this effect. Indeed, Afghan forces are now not only planning and leading most security operations across the nation, but 90% of all military training in Afghanistan is now being conducted by the Afghans themselves. That's a strategic and operational success one that will pay dividends over the long term by helping ensure that Afghan forces can sustain their progress and ultimately help prevent Afghanistan from ever again becoming a safe haven for terrorists. Terrorists that would pose a threat to us, our citizens, and our allies. Another area of the world that has a large impact upon us is the Asia-Pacific region. Canada has long recognized the importance of Asia its continued peaceful rise depends not only upon economic growth, but fundamentally upon its security and stability. Both Canada and the U.S. share with our Asian partners a vested interest in maintaining this stability. 
And this drives our effort to maintain and build on our history of joint cooperation. Thus, we have made a commitment to pursue opportunities not only for increased cooperation, but also coordinated and targeted efforts to build capabilities and to bolster confidence among friends and neighbors. As you might be aware, just a few days ago, our nations signed the Canada-US-Asia-Pacific Defense Policy Cooperation Framework in order to enhance bilateral cooperation and collaboration in that region. This new framework provides the basis upon which our two countries agree to coordinate defense-related activities with our Asian partners in areas of mutual uh, interest while maintaining each other's ability and flexibility to take independent actions or positions. It's the latest example of how Canada and the United States are working together to make our joint efforts complementary and judicious while avoiding duplication. Ladies and gentlemen, as you go forward in your work sharing your thoughts and ideas, I hope you'll remember that you need only look, need to look north of the border to find a reliable, committed ally and friend, one that's making a me meaningful contribution to our common security, whether here at home in North America as key transatlantic partners in NATO or elsewhere on the world stage. The link between our countries and the friendship between our militaries is truly unique and it's also precious. By working side by side, we accomplish more than by working alone. And going forward, we will continue to find more opportunities for cooperation so that together we can make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I'd be happy to entertain your questions. moment here to mic up. So if you have your cards, uh, we'll have folks coming around to collect those now. If you can just raise them up, we'll, we'll um, continue with our conversation and collect those for the follow-on okay. Q&A. Thank you very much, General Lawson. That was um, um, a, a wonderful speech and a great overview and reminder of how much Canada, first of all, um, is engaged in the world, Canadian forces, and certainly how close we are in our own goals and objectives, the United States and, and Canada, with regard to engaging the world. Um, I wonder if we could talk first, maybe, about the end of combat operations in Afghanistan. You, you, you spoke about Afghanistan. You spoke about all the other um, priorities that there are in the world, but also how Afghanistan and Libya provided real world opportunities for the United States and Canada to work very closely together to be interoperable. Following operations in Afghanistan, what are your thoughts about the best ways we can continue to ensure, without that living laboratory, if you will, how we can continue to ensure our forces remain interoperable? Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. It's a challenge that faces uh, Chairman Dempsey and I as we go forward. You know, we leave Afghanistan probably as interoperable as, uh, as an Air Force and Army, uh, especially as we ever have been. And uh, um, right back to my earliest days uh, in NATO in Germany, uh, flying with the Americans and, and watching our troops in Baden and Lahr working with the Americans uh, still it doesn't come close to where we are as we depart Afghanistan uh, now. Um, so the challenge is to capture that doctrine and uh, here back on the continent uh, exercise. It's easy for us uh, from the time winter sets in in Canada, uh, Canadian troops are looking to come down across the border uh, into your great uh, training areas. Uh, and Americans can often be enticed north any time after April as well. Uh, but I think uh, that, uh, bigger than that, we have been uh, engaged. Tactically, I think that that will come uh, easily, but we've been engaged at the very highest levels, uh, operationally and strategically as well, and that will come through some larger exercises. Um, the Americans hold RIMPAC, of course, uh, off the West Coast, and Canada uh, seeks to be a, a very, and expects to be a very large part of RIMPAC. 
uh, and the senior leadership there, and also in our large exercise, Joint Exercise, uh, that's held every two years, uh, we seek and I'm sure we'll, we'll find uh, a willing group of American leaders who will come up to help us with that. So it's an entire range of skills that we've come very good at that we'll want to continue to hone in coming years. You also mentioned, as I think I did in my remarks, the new Canada-US-Asia-Pacific cooperation framework. Um, and you've just mentioned now RIMPAC and other exercise opportunities. What do you think this new framework provides from a perspective of US and Canadian forces, but also maybe more on the, um, on the political geostrategic level? What does it mean? And how does Canada think about Asia as a priority area in its defense? strategy? Yeah, the, the cooperation framework itself is, is not unique. We've, uh, we've got a couple of them already beca between Canada and the U.S., um, ones that speak to Central America and uh, another, uh, the Caribbean. Um, and they've been useful to us because what they do is they lay out a framework by which we can uh, overlap efforts uh, in, um, uh, in operations where that's required or uh, best divide our, our capabilities so that uh, if one area or, or one issue is being well looked after uh, with or without the support of the other nation, uh, that can free up certain uh, capabilities um, for the other nation to, to focus on a different area. So I think um, uh, certainly from an operational point of view, uh, it, it will be very helpful. Uh, for example, right now Canadians and Americans are, are both employed in the Philippines uh, helping the desperate survivors of, uh, of that terrible typhoon Haiyan. Uh, and I think the framework likely would be very helpful in the planning phases and would have been very helpful in the planning phases uh, as we both uh, set forward our, uh, uh, our forces to help there. I think uh, when you get onto the political strategic level, it does say just another area where Canadians and Americans seek to leverage each other in, a, in another uh, arena. Um, you will know that uh, the, the American uh, government signaled a bit of a shift uh, towards the Asia Pacific. Uh, Canada um, is, uh, uh, while remaining uh, tremendously interested in our NATO alliance as well, seeks uh, to strengthen uh, our uh, various alliances and connections uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, so just recently, for instance, uh, we placed a, uh, a general officer on the staff of uh, Pacific Command staff, uh, which is a first for us and allows us not, on, not only to work more closely with the Americans in engaging um, the uh, Asia Pacific uh, arena, uh, but also provides us a little bit more awareness of uh, those things that are strategically relevant as we go forward. In the United States, I'm sure you're very aware that we're in the midst of significant budget uh, battles, dysfunction, some might say, um, even in polite society, one would call it dysfunction. Um, and it's for those of us who watch defense, we are particularly focused on the implications of that for U.S. defense strategy and planning. And I'm wondering if um, how you would describe the cuts in defense uh, in Canada. Uh, I don't think you have quite the political environment we do right now, but surely you must have the same um, sense of general interest in how Canada plans to go forward and, again, strategically where Canada wants to be in terms of its role in the world and how to underwrite that with military capability. I'd love to hear a little bit about the efforts under, underway in Canada, including your own um, defense reform initiative, if I've got the title right, um, that looks to cut inefficiencies to, to uh, free up some funds. Well, good for you. Yes, you've got the name right. The defense renewal team uh, has worked a year. Uh, one of the first uh, tasks that I got from the prime minister upon taking on this position uh, was a direction uh, to maintain uh, everyone uh, in the numbers that I have in the regular force and the reserve forces, all of the capacities and capabilities uh, that we've got right now, but find a billion dollars, so about five uh, to seven percent of our entire budget, um, and to take out of uh, um, the back rooms and the administrative processes to reinvest in the operational part of the forces. That was a that was a very difficult uh, task. Uh, in the past, those with as many years in as as I have will have seen that uh, we've had um, ups and downs over the last 35 years, and usually in the down period, we decrease in size uh, and or capabilities. 
Um, this was a very heartening task given to me by the Prime Minister in one sense, uh, because those very difficult things uh, were not uh, the centre of the task. Uh, and we think we've, we've actually put our finger on 26 initiatives in under seven headings uh, that will allow us to find several hundred million within a couple of years and going on to a billion as required in, uh, in five years and going ahead. Uh, but we, uh, like all departments, like all Western countries, I think, are suffering from uh, many of the same uh, fiscal uh, challenges that, uh, that your country is. Uh, and uh, we uh, it went through a strategic review several years ago uh, and a, de a deficit reduction action plan, all of which has decreased our budget by, uh, by 10 to 15 percent. And this has required all kinds of trade-offs along the way too. So going forward, um, uh, and recently we just had uh, the speech from the throne, which indicates uh, that the government is looking uh, to refurbish their Canada First defense strategy and in that way uh, allows us to look at where we can uh, invest in new areas. So um, there will be trade-offs to come, certainly within a, a stable uh, envelope um, of, uh, of tight resources. Great. And then the last question I wanted to ask is on NORAD. Um, and you mentioned in your comments the in, um, expansion, if you will, into the maritime domain. I think there's a lot of interest, too, on, in the cyber domain, and you, you did reference the NORAD strategic review that's now underway. Can you give us some insights into the areas that you're exploring, the U.S. and Canada are exploring through that strategic review, and what um, types of changes we might expect to see come out of that? Well, I know that the commander of, uh, of NORAD, who is not only the U.S. commander of NORAD, but the Canadian commander of NORAD, and that's General Chuck Jacoby, together with his, uh, his deputy, uh, Lieutenant General Alain Perrant, a Canadian, uh, are going through a systematic review of the threats uh, that NORAD expects uh, to potentially uh, face them uh, in coming decades, and uh, what kind of uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance is required, and not only for the aerospace threat, but also offshores, all the way to how do you harden the very core of NORAD capabilities uh, from cyber uh, threats. Uh, and, uh, and as you may well know, um, much of NORAD's uh, current uh, early warning system is based on a distant early warning set of radars that were uh, put up in the, in the 1950s and refurbished in the late 1980s, that's coming around again. And I know that one of the things that NORAD's looking very carefully at is how do you move that forward to provide more warning time? Uh, and, and does it need to be ground-based? Are there other ways to do that? And these are fundamental questions that speak to, uh, to the most strategic threats facing our two nations. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over now, it looks like, to Stephanie Castro, who will uh, relay some questions from the audience. Sir, it's, it's amazing always to get these questions from the audience, and the first line is almost always, thank you so much for your candor and for being here and agreeing to talk to us. So thank you on behalf of the audience members. Um, the way Sam and I have divided these um, are sort of topically, and I am the lucky person who draw the short straw on the budget questions. <laughs> and so the first two questions um, are very discreet, and they're about, um, one is about the um, Auditor General's report that was reported in the news earlier this week about um, the planned um, procurement strategy for ships. And given um, the Auditor General's somewhat um, candid and scathing remarks on, on the inflexibility in budgeting, can you give us a little bit of your insight into how do you think about um, the longer term 30 year strategy for ship procurement when it comes to rising labor and um, material costs. The second specific question was about um, the close combat vehicle and the F-18 follow-on. So those are sort of the, the more difficult kind of programmatic questions. And then the sticky question, maybe not a difficult question, but a sticky question is, looking forward in, in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, you've talked a lot about today the importance of working together as a team, um, but in light of as you mentioned, the fiscal difficulties here in the U.S. and also in Canada. Um, how do you think about being a, a coalition partner, and what are you looking to the U.S. to provide as well as a coalition partner? Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and, and I think uh, what I'll do is, uh, is take the uh, second one first and the series of first ones uh, second. Uh, what we will seek uh, from United States um, 
certainly at home is to be a great partner as, as uh, the U.S. Armed Forces have been over, as I say, 100 years uh, in the security of, uh, of the continent. Uh, but I think that, uh, like most other nations, uh, we will be seeking good, strong, cogent leadership uh, from Americans uh, internationally. Um, it, uh, it's unfair, uh, certainly, how we all seek uh, the American point of view, uh, but it, what, what wonderful things it says about the people of this nation, the leaders of this nation, uh, that so often uh, that desire from coalition partners is met time and again. Um, Americans, I think, largely uh, get uh, maybe feeling some fatigue from having had that leadership position uh, for so long, uh, and, uh, and yet it, uh, it comes with having been um, a leader uh, so greatly respected for so many years. Uh, on, those, uh, on those first questions, um, the very heartening thing is that as we go forward with a rewrite of the Canada First defense strategy, uh, the government makes very clear to me uh, that the commitment is there for the equipment uh, that was listed in Canada First defense strategy uh, based on uh, the right of 2008. So this includes a replacement uh, for fighter aircraft. It uh, includes a uh, replacement of several vehicle fleets for the Army, and it includes a series of ships, including uh, Arctic offshore patrol ships, uh, joint uh, supply ships, joint support ships, and uh, a new uh, combat surface combatant. Um, I think what has um, surprised Canadians, uh, certainly Auditors General uh, recently, and, uh, and maybe even members of the military and the government uh, our, ourselves over recent years, is when we talk only about the price tag uh, and then expand uh, to take a look at what it will cost to run the equipment. Um, when you buy your Ford Cortina, you come up with one price. When you add everything in for running it for the 23 years that you'll run your Ford Cortina, it's entirely a different price. The nice thing about that different price, that long price, the one that includes operation and management for many years, is we hold a leverage lever on that. So in fact, we can throttle back or throttle forward as required to meet strategic and operational needs. Um, the, the part, of course, I am most interested in uh, as uh, the chief of the defense staff and, and the individual who will be providing options uh, for our government to be not, all, on, not only in uh, defense of Canadian interests, but also as good coalition partners, is having the equipment there. So I very much uh, am heartened by the fact that the government remains committed to these things, and I look very much forward to the delivery of the, the first of these vehicles. Uh, how many come, the numbers uh, remain in our Canada First Defense Strategy, and uh, I have every hope that those numbers will remain the same. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I have a number of questions here on the Arctic. Uh, so beginning with the framing that Secretary Hagel last week uh, released the U.S. Department of Defense Arctic Strategy in, in Halifax, uh, along with the fact that uh, Canada currently leads the Arctic Council and will be followed by the U.S., some of the questions are uh, about what the potential is for U.S.-Canada cooperation uh, to advance the North American agenda when it comes to the Arctic over the next several years. And, and under that, there are actually a, a couple of questions on capabilities. You had mentioned uh, the investments that, that will be made in the offshore cutter uh, and satellite capabilities for, for monitoring. Uh, what other capabilities uh, does Canada have in mind? And what capabilities does, does Canada think the U.S. should contribute? Somebody asked, is the U.S. free riding off of Canada when it comes to Arctic defense issues? I'll answer that last bit right off the bat, N no. Um, the, uh, the population in Alaska itself far outnumbers uh, the, uh, the northern populations across all of uh, the Arctic in Canada. Uh, therefore, in, in fact, when we had a terrible accident, uh, aircraft uh, landing short of alert uh, in the early 1990s, in fact, it took us days by ground uh, to get to that site, and we just arrived there as our friends uh, from the United States Air Force arrived, having started uh, from uh, Alaska. 
Um, but this does speak to, it, it was a very interesting presentation that uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel gave at the Halifax International Security Forum uh, on the weekend in which he, he presented uh, the, uh, the framework uh, for the United States uh, going forward. Uh, and it, uh, it spoke not only to the importance of the Arctic, but also a uh, concern towards um, uh, environment and climate change. Um, all of these things uh, really are very heartening in that uh, it confirms the, the fact that the uh, United States is like-minded with Canada and, in fact, all the eight Arctic nations in seeing the Arctic as free of military competition. Uh, that's a very important point uh, because uh, it, it frees the military uh, chiefs of defense, like myself, to focus on providing military support uh, to civil authorities. Uh, and all of those things appeal to all of our better angels. A couple of years ago, I was the head of mission for the Canadian delegation that came together with delegations from each of the Arctic nations to discuss uh, the Arctic uh, Search and Rescue Treaty which did end up with a legally binding treaty, uh, which really was a, a tremendous step forward in listing all of the capabilities, uh, meager as they may be. I tell you, if you're, you're thinking of being an adventurer, adventurer in the far north, uh, better wear a wetsuit, or if you fall in, better be prepared to survive for a few hours uh, while we determine how best to get to you. Um, the fact is that anything that happens in the north on a small scale or a large scale is going to require the efforts of one, two, or several of the Arctic uh, nations up there. Uh, so these other issues, uh, like uh, the military input to support an environmental disaster, these are the kinds of things that we're working on, not the basing of troops up there with the idea of providing military might or capability for that, uh, for that purpose. And another uh, question from the audience on uh, your views on the U.S. use of lethal unmanned aerial systems, drones, uh, by the United States in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And the second part of that question, does Canada have any plans to purchase this capability going forward? So views on the United States use in, uh, since 2002, when the first one was fielded, and, and uh, views on whether Canada needs this capability. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, military leaders of any kind will have uh, very few intrinsic concerns uh, about the use of kinetic force uh, in support of a valid um, operational campaign. Uh, so if a uh, kinetic round is propelled towards an enemy, a confirmed enemy, uh, for strategic purposes by a rifle, by an artillery piece, uh, by an aircraft manned or by an aircraft unmanned, uh, any of those that end up with uh, a, a desired end state uh, is a supportable uh, point of view. Um, to answer the first uh, part, sorry, I think the second part of the question, uh, the Canada First Defense Strategy back in 2008 signaled that Canada would be finally buying its own capability of unmanned aerial vehicles. It's yet to be determined whether ours will carry lethal uh, capabilities on board or just simply be for uh, electronic, optical, and IR uh, surveillance. Um, but having said that, Canada has been effectively using uh, unmanned aerial vehicles themselves, rented, leased, uh, through the Afghanistan war and on board our ships that are right now in the Arabian Gulf uh, to great effect. So we're in the game uh, along with uh, many uh, NATO allies uh, and uh, delighted by the capabilities it gives us to, to use the high ground in, uh, in reconnaissance and surveillance. Can I just ask a question linking the last two questions? Unarmed uh, ISR capable unmanned systems would seem to be a great way forward in the Arctic for maritime domain awareness. Um, is there any effort underway to build any kind of architecture there that uses um, unmanned systems? Well, it's a great question, isn't it? Because even as we uh, go back to one of our earlier points, uh, that distant early warning radar line only really provides a warning. Uh, short of the Arctic, Ar Arctic archipelago. So the back uh, few bedrooms of our house really are unalarmed 
by the alarm system we've got in place uh, right now. And the sense is uh, that unmanned aerial vehicles could go into a spot which is really very difficult for human beings to operate in for a good portion of the year and provide a sat. The, the, the unfortunate thing about it, of course, is you quickly run into communication problems as soon as you get above 60 degrees north, 65 degrees north, and you can no longer see the satellites that, uh, uh, that are in geostationary stationary orbit over the equator. Uh, therefore, what you need really when you talk about infrastructure is less about uh, towers on the ground or buildings on the ground and more about a constellation of, uh, of satellites that, uh, that provide you this communication link. And then once you've got that link, um, what's the uh, endurance of these machines that allows you safely to, to send them out and bring them back? Uh, so um, there's also an interest in aerostats and the technology that mm -hmm. that could bring uh, each of these for anyone who's been in the Arctic, you know, we speak uh, about that, and, and certainly we're, we're opening up a new set of uh, beachfront properties up there at a much greater uh, rate than we expected. Uh, but anybody who has been up in the Arctic and actually worked or flown over the Arctic will know for the, a good portion of the year, it really is a terribly inhospitable uh, place and a very, very difficult uh, set of uh, challenges whenever you want to operate anything uh, up there. So the, it's of great interest to us and I, I think likely we will find a mixture of manned aircraft and unmanned vehicles uh, and uh, tethered vehicles to, to provide us that capability. Very good. Okay, Stephanie. Sir, I have one question about the NORAD strategic review. If I could ask you to put your prior hat back on. Um, with NORAD in, in charge of aerospace warning and control for 50 years and then adding an additional mission of a maritime warning. Can you talk a little bit about what the future may hold for NORAD um, and what kind of additional mission sets that, from a Canadian perspective, you might like to see come on down the pike? Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because back in, in 1958, it truly was only aerospace uh, defense uh, bombers, and we pretty much knew uh, where they would come from if they were going to come, and it would be up over the North Pole, so it was pretty much uni unidirectionally focused, uh, and, uh, and you knew what you needed uh, to defend yourself. Um, of course, uh, I think it's probably our parents or our grandparents who were even trained in getting underneath their desks for that threat. And there were uh, over a couple of hundred thousand people who daily wore a NORAD patch to work. You know, when people say that things have gotten uh, tougher and more complex uh, in the strategic arena, um, and I think they're right. It is more complex. But my goodness, we certainly stepped back from uh, uh, a potential uh, set of threats that, that, uh, that was so um, apparent and ex existential at that time. Uh, today, we count uh, approximately five to 7,000 people Canadian and American who wear a NORAD patch to work. There are others who support NORAD, but really that number has come down uh, with a decrease of that existential threat. But we no longer look directly north. Uh, now we talk in terms of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and those won't specifically come over the north. They can come over the west. They can come over the northeast uh, to, uh, to hit downtown uh, North America. So really, <clears throat> that unidirectional look that we, that we looked uh, uh, to, to defend against uh, is now omnidirectional uh, and inward, ever since 9-11, inward. Uh, so I think, uh, and a recognition that threats can approach uh, from offshore as well. So this linkage of the maritime warning, not maritime defense, but maritime warning that came in in 2006 really did expand uh, NORAD's warning duties. So the question naturally comes along, now that you've got this very uh, efficient and effective warning capability that goes directly into our most senior decision makers, what else could it be used for? Could NORAD aid Cyber Command, for instance, in getting the message out uh, to these senior decision makers uh, when the time comes, rather than have Cyber Command itself stand something like that up. Uh, is, is, are there other um, inputs that can be uh, coalesced, brought together in kind of an all-sensor all integration center at NORAD to provide uh, these sorts of warnings? And I think what we'll find is uh, the answer will be yes. It'll be interesting to see uh, just exactly which capabilities 
uh, NORAD will be given to respond. Right now, truly, it is only within the aerospace defense line that NORAD has any um, duty to respond. This is a, another Arctic uh, question. And this is specifically asking, do you see the Arctic Council as ever having a budget for acquisition of military hardware, i.e. surveillance, uh, re reconnaissance or, or search and rescue capabilities. So should there be an operational role for the Arctic Council and is that a, a possibility going forward or will it just be bilaterally and multilaterally that yeah. there will be Arctic cooperation? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I have to, uh, in full disclosure, say that, of course, uh, um, Canada's um, partnership in the Arctic Council is led from the foreign affairs uh, department and anything that we do in support of the Arctic Council uh, is done in support of uh, DFATE's efforts, what we call uh, foreign affairs and international uh, trade development. Um, I, I think uh, what, I, what I would say is what the military can do in support of the Arctic Council, uh, and maybe there's some implications uh, that would shed some light on that question, is uh, is exactly what we've done over the last couple of years. And as Chiefs of Defense of the Arctic Nations, we group together at least once a year uh, to discuss uh, capabilities that are in support of our mutual uh, civilian authorities. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful pressure release point between uh, Russia and the other seven uh, Arctic nations uh, because, again, most of these things appeal uh, to everyone's uh, better angels. So I, I don't think. Um, Likely, uh, most of those things that the uh, civilian authorities will require uh, in terms of operations in the north will be supplied by the militaries of those eight nations. Uh, I think it uh, unlikely the Arctic Council itself will become uh, an operational function. I think it will continue to look at the militaries. So then the question uh, comes to, uh, will the militaries band together uh, to buy pieces of equipment? I think that's probably less likely as developing in individual national capabilities and then throwing them for certain operations into a bin as we would uh, uh, to support an Arctic search and rescue operation. I have a question from the audience that talks about a, a little bit more um, border focus than what you've been talking about um, in terms of interaction between the two militaries. And given that Canada Command has been now merged into, um, I think it's Canadian Joint Operations Command. That's right. Um, <laughs> I would like to know um, the interaction between the Canadian Joint Forces Command or Joint Operations Command and Northern Command and operations along the border. What springs immediately to mind is always consequence management because if something happens in Vancouver and there's a southerly blowing wind, Seattle's at risk. Um, and the opposite is obviously true. So could you talk a little bit about border cooperation between the two militaries? Right. Um, you may be aware that there's a, a combined defense plan that speaks almost directly to that. And uh, I think the combining of uh, our Expeditionary Command and our uh, Canada Command and Operation Support Command into what you just uh, uh, named the Canadian Joint Operations Centre has been a really, uh, has had a coalescing effect for discussions uh, with Northern Command as well. Whereas they would have to uh, discuss with one portion of our operational commands, uh, now the entire command uh, is focused uh, in, a, uh, in, in a very coalescing way. Um, so I think um, what uh, we're, we're very careful with the border, of course. Uh, we don't um, approach the border from uh, disaster response uh, purposes the way we do for aerospace defense purposes. I think some people would say that if NORAD were not stood up as a binational command as it is now, uh, back in 1958 for existential reasons, we likely would not have ceded to each other the sovereignty uh, that goes along with it. But having done so and having had no problems, the idea of not having to get any authority to fly our jets south across the border uh, to prosecute requirements for NORAD is really a very useful thing and exactly the same for American jets going north. Not so regarding a disaster uh, management and, uh, and consequence management. Uh, we're very respectful to each other's borders. We're very respectful to the requirement to ask permission to carry weapons in the other's territory. Uh, but it's also quite an easy process because it's based on one of unbroken trust. 
so even though it's a bilateral relationship as opposed to a binational relationship for these things, I think we've seen it having great effect, and not only uh, with Gustav and various uh, other um, uh, disasters that have befallen our states and provinces, we've been of great help to each other. But also, as you said, during the Olympics, um, so much uh, nuclear, biological, chemical uh, capability that was resident in the states just under Canada was put on offer uh, to the Canadians as required, um, uh, should it be required during the Olympics. It wasn't, but there was a perfect example of how our combined defense plan could support uh, potential operations together. Go ahead. This will probably be the last question. Uh, from the audience. Uh, the quadrennial defense review is going on at the Pentagon now, and you're going to see Chairman Dempsey uh, uh, later today. What advice uh, might you offer him on an issue that, that you would like to see taken up in this QDR from an allied perspective? I hesitate because it's a very presumptuous thing that I would uh, counsel. Uh, uh, assuming he asks you. Yes, yeah, assuming he asks me. <laughs> Uh, General Dempsey as he deals with uh, potential sequestration uh, 2.0. Um, I think I probably would fall back to, uh, uh, to that very thing I said a little bit earlier, and that is that uh, I'm only one chief of defense representing one military amongst dozens of others who will look to uh, the United States uh, Armed Forces, the leadership of the United States Armed Forces, uh, for leadership in the problems that will face groups of us, all of us, alliances within alliances uh, going forward. And, uh, and I, I think there really is, I haven't noticed it with the chairman himself, but I think there really is a sense occasionally of fatigue uh, amongst those nations, uh, that nation, yours, that so often needs to take on that role. Uh, so if the chairman asked for my advice, I'd say, uh, keep on uh, doing those tremendous things that you do, which is including capabilities of international leadership. Uh, and, uh, and we have very much learned uh, from our American brethren um, uh, how best to do that. Love to take on that role ourselves, but I can tell you that uh, most of the nations of the world, oh, they'll look for Canadian involvement in these things. Uh, they'll be seeking US leadership in years going forward, as they have in the past. Well, I can't let you go without talking about NATO. I'm amazed that it hasn't come up yet. Um, so let me just, since it's the last question, I'll ask it very open-endedly, and you can take it where you like. Um, you mentioned in your remarks the importance, the continuing importance for the U.S. and Canada of the transatlantic link. Um, NATO is approaching another summit. It is coming uh, to a different phase of its operations in Afghanistan. There have been uh, smart defense suggestions. There have been um, framework partner suggestions. What's your um, sense of where NATO as an alliance needs to go to uh, best capture and defend common interests? Thank you. I, I think that um, when we look ahead and, uh, and see a NATO five years from now that, that supports the most likely of um, challenges and issues that will face us, we'll see one uh, that has more interdependence and, and reliance. Uh, you speak about connected force initiatives and smart defense. That all speaks to training together uh, uh, sm smartly, uh, lower cost, um, perhaps fewer uh, ready forces, uh, and yet forces ready within nations um, to join in uh, as required operationally. Um, when we talk about smart defense as Canada and the United States, uh, we talk about our European partners training with us over here in North America as well, uh, which hasn't been usually uh, what we've seen um, with our uh, training. Canada and U.S. have either historically been uh, posted uh, forward uh, to Europe uh, or uh, moving there for, uh, for exercising. That's not absolutely necessary. There are NATO nations that train regularly in the United States and others that train regularly in Canada. We can coalesce for a connected force that, that allows us to be interdependent for training here uh, too. So I think we'll see us working uh, smarter, um, more interdependently and uh, using fewer dollars uh, to provide the capabilities that, uh, that we've seen in use in recent years. 
Very good. I'll let you off the stage with that. Uh, General Lawson, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, I also know this weather is extremely mild from your perspective, and um, I have no doubt that you will have no trouble getting back to Canada from the U.S. while all the U.S. airlines shut down. <laughs> so uh, greatly appreciate your time here today, and please join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy.